Geile Show. Nice show. Now you have to help me a bit. What talk is coming now? What is up, up next? Bit louder, please, again. The end of the year review. Constanze Kurz, Frank Riga, and Linus Neumann. Have fun. And also have fun with our uh, English translation, of course. Test, test. Yeah. First, we have to thank some people. Um, we have to thank for this video. Some of you may not have seen it before this talk, but yeah. Well, I thought there would be some round of applause here. Um, the audience is shouting again. The speakers have no clue. There were a few screens, screens that weren't working before, so now they're showing the um, video again. That kind of sums up all the uh, congresses we've had since 1984. Actually, the interpreters, interpreters thought that this would be a rather bleak thing, a review, but it turns out to be the biggest party of all so far. Well, the first time it didn't work, so now we'll go another, so now we'll go again. Of course, this is a hacker congress, so obviously the technology is not going to work. Because these are not the people that know how to use their computers. We were wondering whether to run a live commentary on, on the second run of that video, but... If it's ever going to start. Oh. So, first congress. Internet for beginners. How does the computer work? Thank you. 
louder. I want to see this hole erupt louder. And now the end of the year review. Frank, Constanze and Linus have fun again. In the background, we never see Faradus coming out of a black hole. The black hole that we just went through. So, I mean, of course, we don't want to take over this room for uh, such a long time, but of course, uh, apparently it was a bad choice to show it a second time. But, of course, we're not going to do an end of the year, like a year review of the last 30 years. We're going to look back on the year 2013. And you'll probably feel a bit like us. Every time we prepare this, we recognize a few things again that we've actually for we had actually forgotten. So it's also also always um, in our know. audit. So we'll talk about um, the activities and uh, what we did, and and of course the other two are also going to say something. Um, uh, what she's actually saying is that we probably forgot a lot of things again, so in the end we're going to ask you what we forgot. One of the things we noticed when we prepared this talk is that this club became so big and that there's so many different activities that even us who are dealing with it so much and who are actually dealing a lot with representing the club to the outside don't really know about everything anymore and we can't even see everything, so we have to rely on you guys to help, help us keep this complete. So, yeah, the focus is going to be on the activities of the federal CCC, Germany-wide, and a bit on the NGO-like activities we have. And that n doesn't necessarily express what's happening in the smaller circles, but it's more about what's happening on the uh, national level. Um, for example, right now, we have uh, 24 air fires, which are uh, local um, cows meetings or cows clubs, satellite clubs. So, of course, if we only talk about the activities of the national CCC, that's maybe what uh, the public's most interested in. But, of course, the actual projects are mainly happening in the small regional cities and clubs. I mean, you've got a micro, mic of your own. I just wanted to remind you that we're missing we're missing someone here who normally should be here with us. I mean, traditionally we're here with four people, but because we have this team uh, with uh, the people from for the PR, and there's someone who's actually taking care of um, the people who are up and coming right now. And he uh, <laughs> he he wants us to tell you that he's in bed with two girls. You can make of that what you want. Generally, we've got our team that's uh, occupying themselves with uh, PR, and we made this team a bit bigger last year, and we're really happy about that. Um, already, because we want to change the focus of the press team that has always been on Berlin for a long time, and. That's why we now have speakers in both Hanover and Hamburg, so that we don't only have the speakers, uh, the representatives in Berlin. So now we're more people and can probably fulfill the expectations that have risen over the past years. The people who may not know this all work within the press, with all the pre within the press team, is of course volunteer on a voluntary basis. Oh yeah, I have to say something else. Um, we have to have a full disclosure. So of course, we normally do this end of the year review uh, early in the morning, maybe 6 a.m. or 11 a.m. And normally you have to uh, kind of take the audience out of their lethargy. They're kind of tired. But now in the evening it's a bit different, so we kind of have to get used to this. Of course we're happy that you're all still awake, or already. And I also we also can tell you th the reason for this. We put this um, in the evening because we we couldn't bear it on our conscience to take anything out of the program to have this end of the year review. I'm especially proud of the program this year. We worked together with a content team that was a bit bigger this year, and they worked so hard, and we 
fought with him a lot about these talks, so that's why we ha put this talk here. So to have more slots to take in more talks for the main program of this Congress. It wasn't so... I mean, it was a bit for our benefit, to our benefit as well. I six in the morning, you know, well. So traditionally, when we first come to the development of uh, our members, and we have to say there was uh, a huge addition of members. We here see the new memberships per week um, until the beginning of December. And now you guys have to participate. What do you think, where do these, uh, where do these peaks come from? Um, any ideas? NSA? Yeah, we see a huge wave beginning in June. And so you can kind of see them as um, supporting us. But that's not all of the, these peaks. Where are the others from? So the Congress is the peak at the left, right in the beginning of the year, the highest one. Yeah, that's the people who think they can save on the entrance fee, which you get cheaper if you remember, but they who are a bit too late and then actually get regi register registered in January. So actually we can't really say how many members there are that are not regularly paying their fees. So we we asked you to, after you got the letter, to actually send in your money. So if next year you want to see bigger bigger members here, you should simply pay your member fees. It's really easy. So we have a small peak in May, we'll talk about that later. But we especially have the bigger peak in September. Any guesses? Some people are referring to an interview our Chancellor gave in August in, or in July, I think. One one person actually guessed it, right? But well, let's wait. Maybe it was the elections, and maybe we were wrong, because people were frustrated by the, by the result, and that's why they entered, uh, they became members of the CCC. Well, we are not a party. Let's just remind you of that. So if you can't guess it, we'll talk about this later, and you'll all say, of course. So we had it. Oh, the fingerprint hack of the new iPhone, when where Starbucks hacked Touch ID. Now you also know what we're gonna do next year. Psst. So we also wanted to talk about this uh, small peak in May. We have. Um, f a view that's a bit up close, where you see it per day, and you see this anomaly. <laughs> We've got a chart here where it's called May anomaly. So we wanted to find out why, what happened there, because there wasn't anything. So we found out that the KIT, which is the contact institution at a uh, university in Kaiserslautern, all of them entered, uh, became members of the CCC at the same time. So, uh, greetings uh, to Kaiserslautern and the university. And we were also a bit confused, wh wh what's the KIT, uh, where is it? So, we went to their website and we also found out that apparently they collectively came um, to the CCC. Well, of course, yeah, we can say that over the years we still have uh, members are still member number numbers are membership numbers are grow still growing and it's moderate, but um, the people joining are far outweigh the members that are leaving. And of course, the members that have been inside, members of the club for a longer time are more, are supporting a bit more. And of course you have to see that these members are, those people who are members in the CCC EV. And then of course they're um, the people who are inside the regional clubs and members there. Of course, a lot of them are also within, within the CCC. 
but it's not all the same people. So there's always been a question, do I have to be a member of the CCCEV to be a member of these smaller hack hack club, hacking clubs? And the answer is, yeah, sure, if you want to. Um, we use your money well, like um, to invest it in congresses like this one. And of course we try to have some member service, but the main fun and the main activities, the main activities, mm. <laughs> she, she, she thought he was referring to the local clubs, but he apparently didn't wasn't talking about that. So at its foundation in 1984, the CCC had a difficult decision to make. There were two options. Either we would have um, an association or we would have a registered association. And there's some kind of legend. And um, it's possible that we went to register association for uh, tax reasons or maybe because it's just easier. Well, I, we should also say we mentioned that there's 24 regional circles and um, we're also supporting them and the biggest ones are still Berlin, Hamburg and Cologne but this year uh, Munich rapid grew, grew rapidly and is uh, about to catch up. So talking about statistics we'll talk a bit about what we're having here. We had a, almost 9,000 requests to pre press at ccc.de over the past 365 days. You have to take off about 12%, that which is probably spam. And apart from the normal press requests, after everything you can imagine, there's also going to be about one or two um, presentations per week that uh, people are sending us. So it's probably a quarter more, maybe a third more than last year. And that's only when we get v via email. So of course there's also the telephones that are ringing all the time, which is also pretty annoying sometimes, especially for you. I have to, to say the volume is pretty big just for the journalists who are present here, just to know why you might not get a response immediately when you email us at press at CCCD. Maybe you might can understand it like this. Well, the complaints are of course in within these numbers as well. <laughs> Included in these numbers. Well, there the enlargement of the press team kind of coincided with this. We also want to disclose how the chaos updates our Twitter account, how it works there. We normally have all press press releases and message from the regional circles and uh, 2.3 tweets per day. Um, um, and the retweet uh, ratio is quite low actually. Uh, official, official releases, uh, we just put them out and uh, no matter how many retweets there are. But the kind of retweet is interesting, Jabber especially, uh, which may be because uh, we had to retweet a number of times that unfortunately the Jabber server was down. Um, so if anyone is asking, asking why the Jabber is not working, there are technical reasons, of course. But one of the reasons is that we would like you not to use Jabber CCC, DE, all of you, but start your own servers instead. Uh, so we try to put that into practice and uh, during the year, uh, around the end of the summer, I think, uh, we uh, uh, we pointed to the Darmstadt CCC's Java server and uh, uh, Java CCCD was down at the time uh, and we were flooded with the requests and they kind of complained that maybe that was a bit much. Uh, but it just uh, support decentrality. Uh, we want m more Java servers and uh, um, and if you're wondering what else you could run, a Java server is a great idea. So uh, not least we know that, uh, well, never mind. Uh, so we retweet uh, local news, uh, regional circles. They all have their own, uh, um, there's a whole um, 
group of CCCs uh, who communicate events, uh, and there is KS Radio and uh, and particularly uh, the Swiss CCC. Uh, so there is a bit of a family retweeting that's going on. Uh, while we are talking about social media, uh, there are things that we do not do, such as Facebook <laughs> or NSA book, as the slide now says. We are not on NSA book. So, um, considering that, we'll have to say that we've always been uh, had the uh, criticism that you were not there and we sa said no, but everyone said, well, everyone is there and why aren't you? No, we still said, and um, all kinds of people said to start CC accounts on Facebook. Funny, no, we said, and we had to, we made them delete, we made Facebook delete those. We, there is a procedure for that, by the way. So we, we, we don't want to bother with this anymore. It's just too um, troubling. And uh, if you start CCC accounts, or if you see CCC accounts on Facebook, that's not us. There are some, some funny mixtures on that. They do take over the official releases, Twitter feeds. Uh, it's sometimes kind of bizarre. Um, well, things that not are not really uh, originating from, from us. Um, we don't know who runs this. We don't want to bother to, to go through the click form on Facebook all the time. We are not on Facebook, and that is a political message. OK. Uh, that applause is a bit uh, restrained. I don't know if you feel the same way, but, but since July, I have keep feeling you know, I've, I meet people that uh, kind of wriggle and uh, I had to laugh as Green Greenwald told this story in the keynote. Uh, people start to excuse for their Gmail, make excuses for the Gmail account, so I have it still, but n not much longer. And so the applause here was kind of, uh, uh, so hands up, uh, put your hands up if you have a Facebook account still. Ah, not so few people. So if you had to do this in a normal class at school, or, uh, you would normally get all hands, so well, you're not doing that badly. So a resolution for the new year, right? Um, 1st of January. Uh, yes, there's another thing. Uh, those that uh, want to follow us on social media, these official releases and press releases and all that, of course, at Diaspora and Twitter, uh, we have accounts that just pipe through things. We want to put this into practice. Uh, OK, enough of the prelim preliminaries. Um, uh, what we do in an end of year review, we just go through the months normally. And uh, always we have a kind of January anomaly. Uh, there is hardly any activity apart from resting. And in 2013, that wasn't any different. So let's go straight to February. There's nothing big that we're leaving out. We will leave a few things out because we don't want to keep you until 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we try to focus on uh, the interesting things that had a resonance, that had response, or that were funny, or something like that. OK. Um, one of the things that we keep uh, liking, that we, that we continue to like to do, is the transparency of state actions and. Uh, access for everyone to as much data as possible of authorities in politics uh, uh, and keep um, uh, hold these people to account. And uh, one of the things we put together in, in February, there were actually two uh, news items. One was classic lobbying work in the state of Lower Saxony in the, in the state parliament, questions that uh, were being dealt with in many uh, federal states how open government should now be uh, put into practice in, in concrete uh, uh, terms. But uh, there was a response and a joint declaration uh, from uh, because the federal government started a po portal that uh, federal states could join in with. Um, and um, the question was, is that really uh, according to the definition of ap open data and, and what is to be criticized? And it seemed to me that uh, during the whole year, the whole um, the uh, gov data debate and uh, how federal states or the federal level should treat data um, uh, reached a new momentum, gained new momentum. And uh, this was together with, uh, uh, with the new grand coalition between left and right main parties that 
has largely gone and vanished and uh, may, surely there's another reason for that too um, we do know that the CCC joined in with uh, uh, and we kept talking about the fact that the Freedom of Information Act should be brought to a new level um, the whole issue of freedom of information and the transparency law in Hamburg should have been joined and uh, as things showed in Hamburg there are a few problems there with tr the tr tr transparency law and its implementation and uh, the, the whole culture and it seemed to me that at the federal states uh, that wanted to go the same way such as Rhineland Palatinate and others they are all looking at each other and, and wondering how are things going to turn out and they're kind of in in suspense and uh, uh, one of the things that we um, uh, keep stressing is that uh, is the question uh, who is gaining from these open data projects and who uses them is that, is that actually of use to citizens or as we've seen in some places do these mainly benefit uh, uh, estate agents estate uh, uh, brokers uh, people that get to data more easily to, to conduct their own business and that is a question that we have to discuss is it we can't just keep saying open data is great uh, for every citizen. We have to take care to pour our energy into getting th the kind of data free and electronically readable that is actually uh, of use for political participation. And uh, there was a very concrete project in that respect. One of uh, several, uh, there are several open data projects that are interesting in a concrete way in the club. and. Uh, and th uh, there was the uh, birthday of our basic law in May, and we put this, uh, uh, raised this onto the federal CCC level. There was a platform that people had been building, and it was an idea to s just say a practical project in which the, the open data principles were actually implemented. And what you can do there is um, watch the de development of our constitution, the basic law, uh, what was changed, uh, with which majorities and what the canon of our constitution, uh, how it formed over time, uh, and it, it was quite a nice image of the changing times. It wasn't that often that it was changed, but when it did, it was mainly a reflection of the zeitgeist. And uh, and that, of course, was just one example, and you can continue working with that software and, and reuse it, and there was an explicit call for that. Okay. Um, in spring, we actually entered into politi political action too. Um, there was the question of biometrics, with which, of course, we've dealt with for several years. And there was a hearing at the European Court of Justice. And uh, I have to explain, uh, I'm no lawyer. Uh, I, I put on this robe and uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be helped. Um, so the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg well, had this uh, a French had the, has this French protocol, and uh, as no one could really agree, uh, I had to put on this robe. <laughs> so the procedure is as uh, interesting because it took several years uh, through the administrative administrative course. Uh, an activist person who just didn't want to have his fingerprints handed in, he went step by step from the city of Gelsenkirchen in Northern Westphalia through the different administrative court levels up until the uh, uh, Federal Administrative Court and that ha forwarded this to the European Court of Justice and the question that he raised in his complaint um, uh, pages of arguments uh, against uh, the registration of the fingerprints uh, was then because there were so many constitutional issues uh, and, and basic uh, fundamental law issues uh, with which biometrics is is the legal foundation for biometrics and passports actually valid and, and that was then put before the European Court of Justice it took about five years if I remember correctly uh, and in between there was uh, 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 a complaint for inaction I don't know what the ex exact legal term is uh, about the administrative courts and uh, courts and that was actually successful So it's, it, this is one example uh, how uh, resistance could be uh, done against uh, surveillance technology, biometrics at the legal level. Uh, and that guy is a, a law person. Uh, what was the name again? 
I didn't catch the name. Uh, oh. Michael Schwarz. Michael Schwarz. Um, and resistance on the legal level, of course, takes a certain mindset. You have need a lot of patience, uh, a tough will to to persist. It's one of the most difficult and, and long term ways of changing things. And of course, you can have bad luck. You can fail. Um, now, before we get to the result, uh, we'll have to mention this: the federal, the German government was uh, concerning by metrics. It was represented by the. Uh, Ministry for Economics, which uh, is a tell telling sign to just to give you the reason the government uh, considers the German biometrics law as a, um, a measure of, of economic uh, economic support. Economic, uh, if you ask them off the record, they admit that. Uh, they wouldn't say it publicly. So that was very interesting. And the representative of the economic ministry together with the uh, uh, representatives of the European Parliament before the uh, uh, court process started, they, they complained for three quarters of an hour uh, about the uh, technical council of the KS Computer Club being present and wondered whether that person should actually be allowed to speak. So this, this went on behind closed doors, a dispute, a debate. Uh, and uh, you can see Wolfgang Neskovic, uh, earlier judge at the um, uh, federal court in, in Germany, and he uh, put in a grand speech, but it all was of no use. Uh, ultimately, uh, the uh, judgment was passed in late autumn, and the, the judges uh, couldn't see how um, how the uh, directive on which this biometrics law was founded, how that could be deemed illegal. So finally, all the arguments were not really um, recognized. But that was after the hearing. That was quite clear after he had the hearing already, a hearing like that. Um, it doesn't really have much to do with a court process, as you, as you normally know it. Uh, there are prepared statements, very slowly delivered because there are several languages involved. And I actually had a complaint that I brought forward facts that were not handed in in writing beforehand. Unfortunately, uh, it, it, there's even worse uh, news. It wasn't just that we have a judgment from the European Court of Justice that does not forbid biometrics and passports. All the journalists that were, had been traveling with us, they made nice reports. So we thought at least there's a debate. And then what happened? Pope Francis. <laughs> so there wasn't a single news item. All the, th the footage that they made uh, was drowned by the Pope, and we were quite angry. That was our last chance to have an intensive debate about biometrics, and even at the European level. But then there was the Pope. And things like that, of course, can happen all the time. Uh, you ha can put a lot of work into a project and uh, plan everything very well. And uh, and the partners with, with, with which you work, uh, get them involved. And then an event like this uh, gets in the way, and uh, the one that you can't foresee or influence. And then the whole thing just, just drowns uh, completely. And uh, it, it wasn't, you couldn't expect it from Ratzinger's state of health either. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, the point is, yeah, keep having to refer to uh, a fast super glue uh, put on your fingertips. But, and if things continue with NSA as they have done, you don't know, you, you have to resort to subversive measures. And we are a bit unlucky with the courts. Ah, another thing. Yes, I forgot. Uh, maybe the whole procedure hasn't actually ended because uh, I did say it was handed, uh, was forwarded from a German court to the European Court of Justice, and the adjustment was this is not illegal, you can do it, but it goes back to the administrative court. So it could well be that my Michael Schwarz will actually say, well, seven or eight years doesn't really much make much of a difference, it may continue, and maybe possibly the only way uh, the law is so old by now, uh, too old to bring it to the Constitutional Court, but uh, it may land there through the administrative course, courts. I don't know what the legal people say. Uh, I'll be interested. Let's see. All right. So that was very frustrating for me because the arguments about 
um, you you can't really produce safety with this crap. And uh, during the hearing, uh, they stressed the fact that um, this is about uh, defending Europeans from non-Europeans doing weird things with um, European passports. So uh, the whole argumentation uh, in the end is uh, sort of weird and the court didn't really respond to that. Uh, well, anyway. All right, so other annoying stuff. In March, there was an appeal against uh, weaponized drones. This was a um, broadly based appeal from various peace groups, um, unions, a broad spectrum of various groups uh, who joined us in um, um, keeping the Bundeswehr from getting weaponized drones. And the whole discussion about drones uh, sort of uh, filled up the whole year 2013 and um, getting a hand of drones with rockets and other weapons, unmanned robots. But there was also the question about the uh, Eurohawk. And in the press there was the question of what form of killer robots should the federal government um, get a hold of and under what conditions should uh, they be put to use and uh, there we did a lot of work that wasn't as publicly publicly visible uh, as this appeal but there was a lot of consultation going on from uh, parties from um, political organizations uh, what was really wanted was a um, independent technical technical expertise um, <laughs> sort of uh, like a, a explain like I'm five uh, sort of a role for us um, lots of requests from various journalists and parties um, uh, not paid by any industry so this year this was a very important topic in the press and th they wrote a lot about it so in the end the question remains uh, <laughs> What, uh, what sort of business uh, does the Chaos Computer Club have with drones, but we're always uh, interested in the, um, in the relationship between uh, new technical developments and the effects it has on um, society and uh, the general public. And especially in 2013, we really have to say that uh, with the collapse of um, what we thought was IT security up until now. These computer networks and drones with rockets up in the air. Uh, we think that might be a pretty bad idea. Um, in addition to this, uh, the question of uh, autonomy. So these killer robots um, may not be uh, controlled by a person on the ground but uh, get more and more uh, autonomous over time and there's a lot of discussion going on in the anglo-saxon um, part of the world which you might have to explain to uh, german folk right now about ethics um, which you can't really program into these robots so there's uh, technical uh, philosophers who think you could um, program some sort of ethics into a machine, but there might be uh, different opinions on that. S uh, I really know technic uh, technical philosoph philosophers who are really good. Some of my best friends are technical philosophers. <laughs> All right, of course, it's a serious topic. But I think something happened in 2013, especially uh, this documentation. Uh, hopefully, a lot of you saw that, Living Under Drones, uh, in which, for the first time, um, a counter public um, was created until uh, against the uh, industry propaganda. Uh, it even arrived in the UN. 
where they um, they managed to create um, what well, I basically said. Well, they agreed uh, that uh, killer robots might not be uh, a good thing all the time, but there's a uh, better cooperation between various countries uh, that speak out against such um, fight robots which can um, decide whether to kill a person or not uh, autonomously. So um, under the uh, this might have been influenced that a uh, minor American, um, an underage American, was uh, one of uh, uh, one of a drone drones attack victims. So after the Snowden revelations, uh, we knew about two cases where data from mass surveillance uh, immediately led to drone strikes, and we're gonna have to see what happens uh, 2014 um, when we get the uh, uh, documents that Glenn Greenwald promised us. And now, maybe for some not so serious topic, Linus. Well. Um, we were asked to um, give our opinion on the email and we were sort of um, flabbergasted because Harold already formulated um, something that came written uh, to the CCC. 2011, um, all the critique uh, we had on the email um, was formulated and um, publicated. But then two years, nothing happened because uh, no one was interested in using this service. <laughs> it could have been so nice. <laughs> I think uh, in the broad public, uh, this really, um, they haven't realized yet, haven't realized it yet uh, that you have actually have to pay for it. <laughs> 39 cents. <laughs> you know what, what, what this means for me? You know what this means for the um Raseke? Um All right, back to the roots. Um even if you um decide on such a nice uh economy supporting measure, it still has effects on the users. Uh, you still need users. And you find a jurist, um, le uh, legislative um, solution to the problem. So you decide uh, to just demand um, the usage of the email because it's the easiest way to use secure mail. And uh, the law, of course, uh, states that this is a secure way of uh, communicating. But there was one problem. Um, the laws demanded a certain uh, level of security which the email didn't meet. So I already hinted at this. There was of course a solution to this um, where you just wrote a law that defined the email as secure, which um, is a very nice quote uh, but I don't know it by heart. Mm. <laughs> transmitting social data through the email uh, to certain activity services with automatic uh, automatic encryption da 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 uh, is not actually trans is not actually the transmission of data so that's it all right i am imagining right now <laughs> We could also use uh, tricks like this for internet standards. Just write something like, well, ah, encryption, that's sort of optional. It's pretty secure. But there's something else. There was a two-step. All right, so uh, I was invited to the um, uh, some sort of uh, in an Ausschuss uh, with Hans-Peter Uhr, the uh, Minister of the Interior, and an <laughs> interesting man. He can. Uh, he has an interesting. Uh, he uh, looked at me quite interesting. 
So uh, you, you see uh, what kind of suffering we take, especially for all you guys. So I introduced myself and <laughs> said that I was here as a chaotic uh, um, guy from the computer club. That was it. Um, there was a situation, a nice situation. I, I tried to explain, come on, guys, uh, enter an encryption and everything's fine. And of course, it was uh, clear that I would argument this way. And of course, they had arguments against this. And the first argument was, well, does this work on a smartphone? Yeah. Wouldn't um, encourage it, but yeah, works. So I was asked, this end-to-end -end encryption, how do you actually uh, use this? If you're uh, on vacation in Turkey and you go into some sort of internet shop and you want to check your the email. All right, so uh, please repeat this question on a, a slower, slower. So everyone has to think about what, what would you answer in his situation? Um, <laughs> I was asked to repeat the question. And all right, just as a reminder, okay, this is this is this is not funny. That was the uh, the downfall of FTP. No, I'm I'm really uh, honest because this man uh, at the elevator on while I was leaving the building, um, he told me, "Well, you're right, but you know things are different here." And this. And this, I mean, until now, I, I'm still not sure if I should be grateful uh, to him for his honesty or if sh if I should um, um, think differently about it. So anyway, um, you should be able to uh, securely check your the email in an internet shop in Turkey. Um, on a on a device that's not yours, um, trying to use uh, secure communication, I don't think that's really possible. So what about roaming? Uh, well, maybe you get five for free, or I don't know. So well, in this internal affairs committee, we were talking about this whole security issue. Ish um, security issues and so I, I thought I would talk about a bit, a bit about security but it didn't uh, yield any results and basically right after in the ca cafeteria there was another invitation um, uh, which, which was about the e-justice law and this was about that we would now need um, the email for court safe um, communication they needed a few changes um, about uh, the signature laws there because, well, no certificates in the hand of users, so um, the emails couldn't be signed. You don't have a private or nor a public key, so you are not able to sign your d email properly. That poses a huge problem because if you want to actually track um, communication for lo courts, you have to there needs to be signature somewhere. You have to prove that you are who you are, and there was a nice solution because d emails are simply signed by the providers. So this process works. You go there once, show your uh, personal ID, and you get your account. And from then on, everything um, you're writing with this account counts as an official statement um, and an actual declaration that might be used against you after that. And I thought that was a huge problem, honestly. Um, naive as I am. Maybe, like, it's kind of nitpicking what you're doing there. So. So I went to this uh, legal affairs committee and I saw, so all these others, so these people are all lawyers and judges. If you tell them th about this, they will all go, go crazy. And they did because they um, thought that was kind of annoying that I was actually pointing out all these these problems with their, prob with their law. And they told me that you can also hand in complaints uh, with a postcard and if you put a legal complaint into a letter, it's also not encrypted either, so I should please stop complaining. Well, I mean, you have you have to come up with, with something like this. 
Have you asked how many uh, filings of uh, legal proceedings they got by a, by a letter? Well, no, but I said that if it's like that, they don't really need uh, the email, but you can also use these huge postcards that uh, web.de already is. Well, it all didn't yield any results. It's nice that you guys laughed. In the interior com in the um, legal affairs committee, nobody laughed because they knew that I was right. <laughs> it was interesting um, in the aftermath that I got a few documents um, later. I already talked about this in my talk earlier, so I don't want to repeat this. But uh, what I just wanted to mention here is that through a small request in the German parliament by the leftist party, um, it came out that there were a few companies uh, involved in this de-email project, two consultant consultancy companies, one of them regularly working for the NSA when they were uh, working on spying pro surveillance programs. We can say the, the name, it's, well, yeah, I mean, of course, yeah, we can say the name, but, oh yeah, the name is CSC, and they also have a nice service, they brought a nice service for the German state, because apart from the counseling for um, the secure communication for the citizens, they also did the code review for the state Trojan we talked about last year. So it's pretty much the company you want to trust with your secure communication. The other co company was Bearing Point, and um, this company simultaneously also worked on a project with the BKA, the federal criminal. Um, institution about uh, source uh, source communication source surveillance so yeah here you so apart from the declarations we're handing in in a written form and that will also be online on the website of the parliament it was more um, work about we were supposed to explain things especially to the press because the critique of these laws was pretty hard to convey. I found it hard to convey what our point was here, especially because the people who were actually looked into this a lot, uh, looked into this a lot, was isn't that the same thing you said in 2011? And the people who didn't know a lot about this um, really had just blank faces. So there was this interesting mix of people who already l knew a lot about this and saw that there hasn't been really any change. Well, and we were also really successful well, of course, I mean, if you look at the user quotes of the email, we can see this as a success. So maybe maybe we should write this down on our uh, on our uh, sheet that we say we managed to do this. Of course, the registration numbers are apparently not that low, actually. But um, the use numbers of users, the people who actually use it, are much lower. I mean, of course, the nice thing was that all of this was pre-Snowden. And when I... Was during my, the preparation, I let, read some of the wor wor word protocols, and I found a nice quote by Dr. Helmut Vogt that um, in the hacker scene, apparently people seem to believe that there's no server they cannot crack, and of course they favored AIM or uh, the security services, NASA, and so on. But of course, based on this, you can't uh, create a st um, secure standard for everyday communication. But as our favorite interior minister said, hackers will always hack something. Never mind. Have we forgotten it, anything about this? Well, I just wanted to say, finally, what is behind this whole thing? Why are they so against this? all these critiques? I think one of the possible interpretations about this show really is that the other no, no, no government is so stupid um, to provide their citizens, wi citizens with a secure uh, communication system. We will have to do that by ourselves, even in the future. Well, so we're arriving in May right now, so the, demonstra uh, the demonstration season starts, and the Deutsche Telekom, uh, the main German telecommunications, um, the company helped us a bit here. So let's start at the beginning. The telecom has their main assembly in Cologne, has had their main assembly in Cologne. So we thought that we would get enough... Shares. Uh, shares. I mean, enough shares to actually participate in this, but so in the end we just 
we went for a demonstration outside, which was kind of, it was pretty activist for um, the CCC. Well, we had huge transparents and posters and we went into this parking space to put our posters up at night. It was this whole shadow thing. Like his, this whole during the night thing and we were they were almost caught by someone so yeah the ccc of cologne has really done some amazing work there well generally of course we have to say that in, in we also talked about this in the talk o about net neutrality that of course because of this um, thing of Drosselcom, where Telecom basically wanted to make people pay or wanted to make serv providers of services pay so they would be offered, uh, they would be accessible via Telecom. This whole thing really, this really pushed uh, the development for towards net neutrality. And yeah, I mean, if you look at this in the coalition, uh, a coalition agreement, you see that there might be something. And of course, these coalition agreements are only uh, declarations of what you m might want to do, and that doesn't necessarily mean that something's actually going to happen. So we'll probably will have to get active at some point there, and we have to take care that the column doesn't manage to put their um, original plans through. What I think I, I, I seem to notice um, in this whole uh, telecom thing, something that also happened in the States. Well, so you want net neutrality online in the internet. So now we'll put down there in the law, net neutrality in, uh, is um, nec necessary in the internet. But then in the next paragraph, we'll put down what isn't internet. And I think it's the same for the coalition agreement. There's a few, there's so many versions. Oh, there's, there's a, f a final version now, okay. So in that version as well, there was something that said, well, we really need discrimination-free internet and that there can't be a certain multi multiplicity of services, but only a few. So honestly, myself, talking about net, net neutrality, there will always be the n worst possible interpretation of uh, the law, of the existing law, and it's been pretty true so far. Well, the general question is, who's responsible for this? There's this new, uh, this n new internet broadband minister, Dobrindt, the internet highway minister. That's the official title. Okay. Well, he's uh, responsible for the traffic and uh, data highway, the data highway. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, of course. Okay, so concerning what he was going to do, th we haven't heard much from him yet. So, yeah, of course, I mean, in the end, this discussion is going to become interesting again in the uh, in the future. And I'm especially interested because there's a, few, a lot of people who are affected by this. So I think we can assume that this is, a, this is a discussion that will affect a lot of people as well. So, well, we'll see about this. But I just want to mention at this point, the actual success, or the part, partial success against this whole um, Drosselcom thing, uh, was um, the institution, for the uh, the association for cus users and customers that managed to put this through. So they managed to um, make sure that there's a net neutrality clause in all contracts that include any kind of flat rate or broad and broadband access. So here, where Telecom is trying to define the internet in a new way, they will also have to define the flat rate in a new way. That was the German Consumers Association that managed to get that in. So, uh, well, he's a prominent uh, representative of the of of the consumers. So maybe we'll have we'll be able to expect some support there because where consumer consumer rights do get another some more weight where there's other w actors as well. Well, let's be a bit positive. We're not only talking about lose and fail. We'll also we'll also have the big stone thing. Don't don't imagine the all these bad things. I'm not imagining this. It's uh, it's the truth. There's the next fail here. That's true. The next fail is not um, the judgment against uh, formerly Brad Lane or Chelsea Manning, but rather the fact that he, she really didn't have um, a critical public, and that it was really hard. Um, there was also this person here who had a really nice talk at CCC. It was really hard to um, have this communication with Fort Meade, and I, I fear they really didn't arrive much in the pu German public. And of course, there even was um, 
a decision by our members' assembly to actually uh, work and engage ourselves in th for this cause to actually establish some kind of public apart from small demonstrations or virtual pr um, protest actions. In my view, this hasn't really succeeded. In the end, when the judgment was actually um, made, there has been a lot of discussion of this in the public, but before people didn't really talk about this. But of course, there's um, the nice law about Nex O'Brien, who will not spend much more time in a prison. So, well, the demonstration seasons continued in July. Well, that's your part, actually. So, yeah, it was the hottest demonstration ever. It was incredible. It was about 36 degrees. So I was really surprised that there were quite a few people in the end who managed to come together in Berlin. But, of course, um, the reception by the press concerning because of the Snowden scandal who had just started, it was kind of disappointing um, the pr there were only such few people on the streets and this narrative has kind of continued uh, so far. There isn't a single interview in these days we've given over the past days that doesn't include the question, how do you explain the fact that nobody is actually getting upset about this thing? How do you explain, how do you explain this positive, uh, these positive election results for Angela, Mer Angela Merkel? It's become kind of a narrative that apparently nobody's interested in this topic. And concern my, from my personal experience, it's completely different. It's still an everyday topic of uh, conversations, even outside the hacker scene, more with this feeling that you can't really do anything. But apart from that, there's also this huge interest in uh, crypto parties. And you see that this topic is actually concerning people, but still in the press, the perception is more that this topic is really doesn't interest people and, but it's, it, it really contradicts what I'm seeing from day to day where I'm being asked questions all the time. I mean, you probably know this as well. All these people that need help where they want to anonymize and encrypt their traffic, it, it really exploded. This number is, is crazy for me. Well, I think that the critical factor really is this uh, feeling of um, how you're personally affected. And we saw this with our chancellor at the point where it became clear that they had, she had been personally affected. She, at that point, she didn't want to end or terminate the scandal anymore, but uh, preferred to find out more about what was happening there. So I think this is going to be a bit um, of a longer process where people will need to realize that they're actually personally affected because this is something that's actually concerning all aspects of their lives, starting with um, their workplaces that are being endangered by economy, um, economy espionage, economic espionage and terrorist attacks. So there will all be all these late consequences of um, surveillance and espionage and all these um, based really based with these intelligence ag agencies. And this is something we will all have to realize and actually managed to realize what is happening here. I mean, we don't want to put um, a focus on the NSA, although it has been one of our focus, especially focuses especially explaining technical details. I mean, you see, you see it here. We have a lot of talks today explaining several technical details. But for us, it was more the press work was really interesting in this area because we had to read a lot ourselves. There were uh, many different technical aspects. And we we're really in the role of um, the the the, the, expl uh, the person who was supposed to explain and kind of put into context what had happened, especially with the cryptographic aspects of these uh, leaks. It was really hard because it was really hard for the journalists to actually put these things into context and to kind of establish how what it actually meant. It was really interesting in this um, in this context where it wasn't. If you're not in the role where you have to say the same, th because it wasn't this where you have to say, it wasn't a situation where you have to say the same thing once again and again, because there was something new every week. So concerning our press work, um, it got really interesting from the second p part of June on. Of course, it still is like this, and of course, we assume that it will uh, continue next year, as Mr. Greenwald has uh, conti uh, already announced in our keynote. So we assume that it will continue to work. Um, on this and it's not going to be boring for us. It's really interesting what, how many m communication methods um, humanity has produced that you can actually uh, surveil. Or this is our internet philosopher. I mean, it's, it was probably the same for you. You, uh, you can hardly keep track of um, 
all these leaks. And I kind of looked into these l leaks a bit more, um, leaks by another, where um, these leaks haven't really had many um, translations, but you can spend a lot of time with this. So we had another topic which actually dominated our summer. Linus is, uh, yeah, well, you see it. The ancillary copyright law, uh, which uh, as soon as that was passed, the whole debate was actually over. And the interesting thing about this debate was that uh, the media uh, were not neutral. Uh, the media, uh, yeah, well, the uh, de facto, it was a, a, a Springer law, Springer being one of the main publishers, and they were p playing the drums, <laughs> they were uh, s drumming up support, and uh, the other publishers uh, were in a kind of strange situation, stupid situation. They would not get into the same boat with Springer, or, or well, they would have to either or uh, stay neutral or, um, uh, or uh, put uh, up their own position, and there were strange effects. Uh, some, some editors were uh, of different opinion than their publishers, and. Uh, 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 so just about every paper you could observe that observe that in um, the debate was very very strange, and uh, also of course because Google uh, was trying to have an influence and uh, and of course uh, they were then prim primarily perceiving this as an attack on their search machines and portals and. Uh, what we saw there uh, was one of the first uh, debates, uh, conflicts about the uh, flow of money in the digital age, and uh, that was tried to be put into a law. Uh, what then happened was that finally um, it seemed that a, a large part of the members of parliament for the so Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats didn't really want to get into a fight with Springer just before the elections, one month before the elections. So the, uh, those, those were in late September and, and, and the debate was in, in August, so they didn't want to have the uh, German tabloid Bildzeitung uh, as their enemy. Um, and uh, what the, of course, you often understand that politicians, members of parliament, are those elected by Bildzeitung readers. Um, so accordingly, um, the decision was was passed. And what we can see in this picture here is that the uh, parliament, the plenary, was uh, at the final reading, uh, n uh, not when it came into force on first of August, but the final reading before that, and you. Uh, Interesting thing is that they didn't just commit it to protocol without any debate. Uh, the members surely did realize that this wasn't one of the highlights of uh, uh, the parliament's parliamentary work, and not many of those wanted to be caught uh, voting for Springer. Uh, and uh, after that, the whole thing was kind of hidden and. Uh, uh, the interesting thing is how this uh, implemented Google and Springer seem to have formed some kind of alliance rather than got in, get into a fight. But but there are concrete consequences that are really annoying to me. Uh, even if the legal situation is not clear, you can observe uh, new small news aggregators, those that are not uh, having ten thousands of users, tens of thousands of users, those. Uh, have kind of uh, preempted uh, the legal problems, and uh, in fear of the consequences, they ju just switched off snippets. Uh, Riva uh, did this, and some smaller ones, and some actually stopped working. And and the the large players, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, and such, they have snippets too, and clearly, but they seem to have not much uh, worries about the whole thing. They have uh, legal departments, and they have power, but the small players actually are there in consequences that are not getting talked about much. We'll just stop working. And uh, this is actually quite annoying because uh, from the Springer people you hear, well, there hasn't been much damage. And uh, uh, well, let's see how this continues. And the interesting thing is uh, whether uh, anyone from Springer & Co. will dare to um, uh, apply this law against blogs and aggregators. Uh, I expect this will happen, after all, if you look at the way they act. Um, it, I think they want to scrape every single euro from the streets, and uh, and as soon as that happens, this will become a topic of debate as well. 
so now let's just shortly become get to something very current, very recent. Um, well, uh, the actual a fun that we had in August for, um, about the press release on email made in Germany. Uh, we kind of enjoyed that finally the standards from the 90s were finally being introduced and brought into practice. And uh, this kind of vanished into thin air over time. And just just now at half past eight, we talked about this. Uh, everyone can download the talk. Uh, we made a press release about this now as well. Uh, because actually uh, the connections still remain unencrypted largely and, and the customers are not being told about this. So uh, the headline of the talk actually speaks volumes there. Uh, so you could realize that uh, a few weeks Snowden leaks were just batter uh, uh, battering down and, and uh, people were thinking how can we actually gain from this and uh, to just say well okay we'll, we'll We'll uh, just check tick a box for encryption somewhere. Of course, was a great idea. Uh, congratulations uh, to whom, whomever thought up this idea. Uh, email made in Germany, um, routing German email through German li lines with encryption was the idea of marketing. Uh, um, of course, uh, I never doubted that this would have been done to to encrypt emails in transfer, which was just it's just marketing foo really uh i well i i kind of thought i was naive um uh, well just switch on tls you could imagine shouldn't be that difficult should it yes i actually did think it possible that it, it could be done and just a few days ago just by coincidence uh, i thought hmm actually i should verify whether this has been done and just just for completion and they didn't or well, they do but they still support unconnected connections and they don't inform their users about this and uh, still display that this will now be a very secure AMO made in germany and uh, i really have to say uh, you you kind of lost your faith or what? No, I just I I I don't, I don't have the words the to to just uh, just deal with the users' fears so lightly and uh, not even that meager promise that they made was that was really ridiculous. Uh, even if it was true, we would have laughed about this or we did laugh about it and and not even put that into practice. Yeah, well, you, there's nothing really to add there. Um, yeah. Right. Now, very shortly, about the dem demo season again. Uh, coming back to that, this year, then there was the fairly traditional Freedom Not Fear or Freiheit Angst demo in, in Berlin. That actually was perfect, wasn't it? you seem to agree with me that this was by far the coolest banner in, in the demo, but this actually is a symbol. We'll come to that. Actually, the situation was perfect. It was a com an election campaign. Uh, so um, you could be, we had this very bold mass surveillance and, and, and hacking that you could have talked about in the, com in the campaign. Uh, uh, but still you have to say that the Freedom Not Fear demo not only was quite controversial between the various NGOs that were calling for it, but uh, maybe in its result, uh, it was comparatively small. And uh, in, in its results, we did have four years ago, uh, the largest, uh, because the parties were quite, quite intensely debating the surveillance at the time and had different positions on it. And um, and and then we had uh, the uh, chief of staff at the chancellor's office, Pofala, saying that it, the whole affair was over, and the whole um, momentum was kind of taken out. And and then the question: Who would call for the demo with whom and at what time? Uh, those tedious debates between the supporting groups, um, and to have this just before the election, uh, it was not an uncontroversial decision. And also, we had the problem that the the time for that demo uh, was exactly on a, on the day uh, where we had two long advertised CCC events um, in in Dresden and uh, and in Darmstadt. Yes, Darmstadt. So two traditional K 
Chaos Family events, uh, with uh, which attract about a hundred hundreds of people, and and those were not at the, at the demo, and and you could realize, you could notice that. Uh, for the club, that was particularly difficult because uh, those events that had been prepared for a long time and uh, someone would have to go there and, and then these people wouldn't be going to Berlin. So it was very difficult for us. Uh, and there were all kinds of other quarrels as well between other organizations that we didn't have much links with, but we did hear about this in afters. But the momentum, therefore, was rather missing. And uh, the uh, really interesting the the, the the large outrage did not spread in berlin how many were there Twelve thousand, i don't know so uh, it was a relaxed chill, chilled uh, kind of event but there, there wasn't a revolutionary mood there no burning barricades um i think all in all the way it went uh, on the day it was a good or rather bad example uh, about the way we will not achieve much, not be able to put things into practice. And I would like to hope that all people concerned will learn, will have learned their lessons from this so, so that in the future demos like this, we will st have the power again in, in the way it's put onto the streets, that the power that we actually have. Uh, for me, it, it was a rather sad experience. It was frustrating. But many people had this impression, we had postings on the internet, and there was a certain basic frustration uh, because we hadn't got hundreds of thousands of people, which would pos be possible in Berlin. We have seen that l very large demos. And then also the, that all, all those quarrels. Uh, uh, you should pick your enemies wisely, really, and, and that's something to remember. I certainly will remember this, and will you too? Okay, now what do you do as CCC if you are really frustrated and uh, nothing's really working out and uh, you have the ancillary copyright law, the, the email, all kind of worries? Of course, then you find a cool hack. Of course, nothing is as great as breaking something and uh, it gives, gives you as much fun. Um, really, uh, the hack is uh, just the... Uh, Starbuck uh, is now well known, I think. Uh, and where is he? People are pointing towards the stage where someone is sitting at the stairs that lead up to the stage. So w there are several things that we will have to reveal. Reveal. We have to say, no, he didn't do it for money. Uh, there was a, a reward, but he and which he did win, but. Uh, donated this largely to a hacker space. He did not do it for the money. And also, it really was an overnight action. And there was a slight disappointment involved there because uh, uh, we would have expected Starbuck to be more challenged technically to, to achieve this. And he was rather disappointed how simple this was how uh, simple this device could have been broken. Uh, uh, of course, we had, all, we had a different kind of problem there because we did not at all expect to suddenly uh, have to th this, this lifestyle device uh, caused the response to completely overwhelm us. And uh, this, this thing about a day later, there was about a million clicks on YouTube and uh, and then there was, uh, of course, an official CCC address that had been left there. And uh, uh, oh dear, oh dear. So uh, also our record in terms of retweets that we had, uh, we've included this in this picture that was broken. And also the role that uh, the German releases are retweeted more than the English ones. Now this was also broken. So we were kind of overwhelmed, I have to say. So again, the topic of personal uh, of personal involvement, we would we would put out the same video again, wouldn't we? It 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 would, was kind of produced on the fly uh, because of that reward that had been uh, announced. So we were under some kind of pressure and uh, to release and and uh, put it out quickly. 
uh, had we been second, uh, the political message could not have been transported together with it. And uh, so the question, uh, biometrics as identification measure, uh, especially fingerprinting, it just won't work. That was the message, exactly. So um, next time, uh, next time we approach a lifestyle device like that, we will know what to expect, and uh, we will learn from our mistakes, of course, and we will be prepared. And never again we will do this overnight as well. The time shifts, and all, I, I can tell you. So September was. Uh, altogether a very busy month uh, after the summer uh, lots of things were happening one of the topics that we had to deal with uh, was uh, what Glenn Greenwald has already said in the keynote uh, the question where do we actually uh, where do the secret services and these kinds of people get their technical talent from and how do we deal with the fact that some people have, some of these people are from our community and we had the opportunity to uh, that, that someone who um, uh, had been uh, kind of slipped into this kind of activity talked about this and there was an article then in our magazine Datenschleuder uh, how this could happen and uh, how uh, someone as a politically clearly th uh, clear mind uh, could gradually get into a role that where you would work for the wrong people and that debate is very close to our hearts because in the end it is really about which side those people with technical talent are on and whether they're working on on the dark side of power or uh, are they work do, do they work against it so we were very happy that uh, we could uh, publish this article and uh, learned a lot from that and about the mechanisms about uh, how people are led and uh, what uh, ways of, of challenging and encountering that you have. So it, this is linked to from the website. It, it's a must read, I think, and uh, uh, more and more of these companies are around building these tools and uh, uh, the people here uh, are those that are being targeted for new recruitment. So um, I have to say that Frank, uh, Frank mentioned the Datenschleuder, our magazine, Data Sling. This is a preprint because the new Datenschleuder will only be published in early 2014. Uh, it, it was a real fail. We didn't manage to, um, uh, but we're working on it. And uh, there will be a new Datenschleuder soon. All right. Um, I want to tell you about another thing um, because Len Greenwald sort of hinted at it yesterday. Um, and FIFA this year um, uh, listened live to the talk on at DEF CON. So I'm proud that uh, the recruiting sort of um, is different here for us um, because the uh, German intelligence service wouldn't uh, just stand there in a CCC shirt. Uh, you applaud a lot now, but I don't think uh, you can take this for granted. Um, before uh, we had all the proposals for talks, um, the content team for the 30C3 um, had uh, to answer the question, how do we um, um, treat um, talks from intelligence uh, folk from as she said, the dark side of the force. So we as the CCC um, often um, uh, hear that we should have s sort of a dialogue, have s sort of a dialogue and not be like a closed circuit TV. So anyway. Was wurde da gerufen? All right, we don't see um, any reason um, to let these people show off. The, these people have enough um, possibilities to show off, especially not only this, but only yesterday. I think it was very clear when Greenwald said, even here in the German press, it's different than in the UK or in the US. There's a 
um, there's a lot of chances for these people to reach out to the public and so we we don't have to let them do this here and over the years I don't, I don't see any reason for this to change we have to realize that um, the people sitting behind these uh, institutions are the evil ones and we aren't all right talking about um, fighting back um, uh, we ha uh, we had a try um, oh wrong graphic uh, we had a try um, to um, you go through the courts uh, together with Human Rights Watch and the uh, British Pen Association um, to get to the European Human Rights Court um, because we're gonna we're gonna try to bring this case to court I don't know if I can speak about this but I'm gonna say the following um, it doesn't look too bad that the European Court of Human Rights will take this case that's likely The reason to s talk about the positive responses in October, um, there's been a lot of um, publications about the CG C CGHQ, and I think that's a very good sign when, uh, because if a uh, if a court doesn't uh, doesn't care about this, then they won't uh, they won't uh, think about it. So we we hope that uh, they will treat these um, cases, and of course we especially hope that um, this court um, helps in clearing up some facts because that's a problem we have with the German um, administration, the British, and the American administration that uh, politically responsible people don't help with uh, clearing up the uh, situation and of course this court has the uh, measures to demand them to clear up some facts so maybe uh, some uh, publications that are still yet to come will help with that and of course um, the expertise uh, lies with the lawyers but we hope that we can sort of create um, a critical public to help with that and even with British and German people um, there's uh, there's some that um, stand their ground against um, human rights violations all right so I guess we can try right Um, the campaign is called Privacy Not Prism and there's a funding site for that there's already like 20,000 um, pounds uh, which they got in uh, less than 48 hours so we were really happy about that um, from my perspective um, there's really a, a critic and a sort of raging public um, but of course uh, you don't know how to deal with this helplessness because um, there's a lot of people who don't think they're uh, capable of using this um, technical possibilities and are searching for different ways of defending themselves and I think there's a lot of small things that can come together and um, that's a sign uh, that there's support out there so about Snowden um, you will continue um, in November, the uh, campaign against uh, mass surveillance, uh, we joined it. Um, it's about um, uh, keeping uh, human rights within the uh, international telecommunication. The question is um, unsurveilled. Uh, 
The question is, is unsurveilled communication a basic human right? And of course, yes, it is. And we have to make sure that um, this is being kept and not uh, through some sec promises of uh, false security um, undermined. This campaign is uh, very broad. There are a lot of organizations that join together. Um, even after it already started, some some joined later. There's a critical public, definitely, uh, and a helpful public. The question is how how much they can reach the political process. Mm. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> I already uh, see the next slide, so you, you see the previous ones. Sorry. All right. At, at the end of the year, there was uh, for us the possibility to um, say something about um, the public network institution had asked us to make a statement about the obligation to use certain routers if you had a cert if you're using a certain internet provider. And not only other institutions, but also us, we handed in a statement pretty much right before the deadline, also right next, right to the federal network agency. Of course, what we're talking, um, we're arguing against this obligation to use certain um, routers. And I think our arguments are quite good, but I'm uh, quite interested in seeing what is actually going to happen in this area. And on top of that, for us, in all these other declarations we've issued ourselves, that we where also there was a point that wasn't um, too unimportant either, is that by making this uh, obligation a common one, a standard, it uh, kind of promotes certain weaknesses in these uh, systems. If you oblige your customers to use a certain router software, of course, that also means that you will uh, kind of support security weaknesses and you will um, create access for uh, intelligence agencies. So we actually try to make a good points there um, concerning security and we hope that these will actually be included in the final decisions and on top of that of course this kind of helped in the respect that actually in the coalition agreement they say that they um, will want to engage themselves in the fight against this obligation to use a certain router and a certain router software and um, they even took uh, they even used our wording I don't even know what the legally le actual legal word for term for this uh, thing is I mean, this whole topic isn't doesn't really uh, work, um, isn't really being discussed under the term of router router obligation. But the question is, you have to define where the network termini terminal point is. Well, you have to imagine that. Um, so you have the splitter, and then then after that, you have the router at some point. Uh, and it may up with you ending just have just one device. And the question that was to be defined there is. Where does the uh, where does T online's network actually end and your home network start? And uh, these three uh, steps uh, in one device, if if that if that's what you get. Now uh, then, the network operators would of course like to say then that whole device is actually our property. And uh, the uh, question there is quite interesting because uh, a local uh, network, of course. Uh, uh, is technically a very interesting topic if you if you run a local network and it's not a very easy question to answer and the resulting uh, s uh, social consequences let's let's say uh, are even more interesting um, if uh, network operators are able to to uh, impose uh, devices onto us with which we run our no local networks and uh, there was this nice response. And the FSE also had uh, some really nice um, arguments in this uh, in this aspect. They said that because they are the ones who are paying for the electricity that powers these devices, so they are the ones who will be able to decide which devices will be used. So there was also some more um, bullshit about open something. So we also have to start the ultimate round in December. Of course, we have to do this. We also have a symbolic picture for this. If anyone doesn't know this one so far, the person next to our um, former and new interior minister, De, De Maizière, 
is um, someone who was uh, legal, the speaker for legal affairs for the CDU faction in the German parliament. And concerning data protection, she's not she didn't really she wasn't really well versed or well known well i heard she was especially competent who said that well well she's especially competent well yeah but she hasn't been especially recognized concerning data protection oh yeah she has it's just that maybe she's rather she was rather working for abolishing data protection they're talking about the new data protection commissioner by the way so i mean in the end we have to talk about this um, in 2013, we talked about the um, data retention guideline. We talked about this under the new impression of um, Snowden leaks. Um, and the, on, ba on this basis, we can discuss this whole thing in a new way. And of course, this new coalition agreement where they put it in again. And where, of course, within this especially huge coalition, there was nobody who was actually opposing this data retention because of security. Yeah, of course. And secondly, there was also this um, f uh, court ruling um, in the European Court, where, for now at least, they said that this um, uh, original EU guideline is not really uh, or was unlawful and not in accordance with um, the European Convention of Human Rights. Of course, right now we don't really have a liberal uh, minister of legal affairs anymore who could who could actually oppose these things. So the situation from now on will look quite different from what we've had so far. So um, we'll have to wait and see how the new Minister of um, Justice, um, who's called Heiko Maas from the SPD, the German Social Democrats, how he will position himself. And concerning the Minister of the Interior, the former and new one, he hasn't really given any statements, for example, concerning the NSA affair. So there's this well, dead silence. So, well, yeah, there's something. There's, there's some work to do in 2014. So, yeah, please. Um, the coalition agreement is not law. They will be implemented in some way, but we'll assume that the data retention will, for the time being, not be decided yet. Because, uh, and they will probably wait until the final judgment has been made by uh, the European Court of Justice, and they will probably simply copy-paste this uh, ruling. Well, it would be kind of it would be audacious to actually simply do something before this ruling came on. Well, it's clear that this data retention will actually be some mean some more work for us in 2014, and it's going to be serious this time. Yeah. So we kind of arrived at the end of y the year with this. There's a few more announcements, a few things we want to talk about concerning, but concerning our activist work and um, our press work, these were our focuses over the past year. And I mean, there have been indications um, in the talks over the past days um, that Snowden, the NSA papers and the GCHQ papers and the impossible involvement of German and maybe other intelligence agents intelligence agencies will probably mean work for us for at least one more year and maybe f years after that. And who would be interested in the new federal representative for data protection um, who's interested in that? Uh, we can recommend to go to a talk at day four um, by the person who was this data protection representative before. He will speak here. And it's interesting, I think that he, in his eight years um, in this position, has actually gained quite a reputation. The question will be if um, his successor will also be some help for, for us. Because, especially in the public, he was kind of a cri critical person, a critical voice, who again and again uh, rooted for uh, data protection and the protection of citizens' rights. And so we'll see how this continues. And I believe he'll speak about this quite openly because, well, he doesn't hold this position anymore. So he'll probably also talk about um, if this person is actually someone who can do something or if he's simply uh, a, a creation of uh, laws and statutes. We have something to finish this off and we kind of want to close make the full circle with the beginning of this. We 
kind of want to remind you again that there's not only not only this uh, PR work on a federal level, but it is, it's not supposed to be the sole focus because uh, there is of course the um, activities in the local region on the regional level, and for now you can already put down um, the Easter hack for 2014 for in your calendar, and it's called Kehrwoche. Clear out week, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> Constanze had to look it up in Wikipedia herself. And I mean, apparently it's uh, some kind of reference. Apparently it's some kind of reference to a local dialect in southern Germany. So, well, from um, the department about what we haven't mentioned so far. Over the co in the course of the year, there's so many events in the different um, local regional clubs. There's the Siegend, there's, uh, there was OM in, um, in the Netherlands this summer. There's so many events we can't manage. There's GPN. The, we, we, the GPN, we can't, we can't forget it. We forgot it once and we can't, we were not going to do that again. We can't do that. Some, the GPN happening in Karlsruhe. Have we mentioned the second? Yeah, we did. And the MMRs, MR, MRMCD, Datenspor, da data traces. There's the Hackover in Hanover, the ICMP. What else? Uh, there's what happened to Cosint. So, so you see, there's so many events. Even us, we can't remember all of them anymore. And we can't come to all of them, and I think that's really regrettable, because. Uh, last year I promised to ha hold some talks which I couldn't uh, do in the end well yeah so these events are um, multi uh, so very varied ver varied and and <laughs> we don't even manage to announce all of them on our web server so if you look for example at CCCD it's optimizable so for f 2014 it's uh, our new year new year's resolution is to kind of um, take care of the web server a bit better but um, I mean on Twitter we're always pretty much up to date so uh, questions FIFA no you did someone uh, shouted something from, from the audience well I think it was FIFA <laughs> it was FIFA but I don't know what he said but Frank said that he has to put up a new Jabber server yeah. and if you continue ranting you have to write a new one <laughs> <laughs> So, with that, we want to thank you for um, the cooperation because, I mean, we're in the focus of the public and in the spotlight, but of course there's many different teams who are cooperating in this and who are working on this. And we really hope that also this year we'll have nice projects from the regional circles and of course we'll uh, promote them on the national level. And of course, again, we, we would... Um, like to know who's going to be the sexiest air for the regional club this year and of course we're asking for votes again this year so we can present them next year so um air for mannheim who was um sexiest air for for um uh, promoting uh, technological projects in schools so now we're still taking recommendations for the sexiest air for 2013 So talking about this, um, Chaos Machule, this project about promoting technological issues in school, it's one of those uh, projects that regularly fill me, fill me with pride wor working for this club. It's things that actually work where people put in their time and who do a lot of good things and people who generally don't get recognized sufficiently because it's not that spectacu spectacular, spectacular and it's really small things that happen locally but it's um, it actually affects the lives of people in a positive way um, who learn to work with po technology. So I ask for a big round of applause for projects like that. Projects like that. So are we always going to do this end of the year review in the evening now or will we have to get up earlier in the future? No, he shakes his head. So thanks a lot. We wish you a successful activist year, and we'll try to do the same. Thanks a lot. And thanks for listening to the translation. Our translators were Sebastian and Niels and Katerine.